Weald Foundation is a charitable trust that was established in 2003. Its primary objective is to preserve and restore historically significant military vehicles and equipment, especially those from the First and Second World War. Its mission is to educate the public about the history of these vehicles and their role in military conflicts. The Weald Foundation's collection is a rare and unique assembly of working vehicles, both armoured and soft-skinned, and is regarded as one of the finest collections of its kind in the world. As a charitable trust, it is committed to the ongoing maintenance and preservation of these important vehicles in order to educate future generations. We don't have long on this earth, and all we can do within that time is actually ensure that we make a mark in some way. And you put that into the realm of the Wheel Foundation. We want to make a mark so that people would think of the Wheel Foundation as being a center of excellence, striving for absolute authenticity, absolute accuracy. To my mind, the biggest bang for our buck as an organization is what does something look like when it leaves the assembly hall, when it leaves our workshops, when the public actually see it. The essence of the tank is to achieve mobility, to be able to break through fixed defences, and to break through those fixed defences and allow the infantry to stream in behind you. The Renault FT, its design became the blueprint for all other tanks. That's why the Renault FT was so magnificent in World War I. The First World War was a uh, global conflict that originated in Bosnia, in Sarajevo. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. The Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia and then suddenly all the alliances start coming into place. You had Russia supporting Serbia, you had uh, Germany came in on the side of the Austro-Hungarians, and then France went in on the side of the Russians, and Britain went in with France. In 1914, the German army moved against France, and they swept down through Belgium. Slowly but surely, they were held up, and gradually both armies started to dig in. It was just trench warfare, with huge artillery barrages, advances and attacks by infantry, but very little progress either forward or back. Basically, it was a stalemate. Everybody's got barbed wire, everybody's got trenches, and everybody's got very, very big machine guns. At best, you might make a gain of a few hundred yards, or in some cases, maybe two or three miles, but there was never a breakthrough. The problem they had was, how do you restore mobility on the battlefield? In the case of the Germans, they looked at the whole issue of artillery. But in Britain, they invented a vehicle which was designed specifically to be armor plate and to move across the trenches. And this vehicle was nicknamed Tank. The French were also looking at this situation and they decided to develop a tank of their own. Uh, the first ones they built were similar or attempted to be similar to the British ones, but they then moved on to designing an infantry tank. And what they looked at was designing from scratch a vehicle that was able to operate at the speed of which a infantryman could move concept was to have a two-man crew, a driver and a commander stroke machine gunner, and that was designed by Renault and became the Char d'Assault Renault.
French Renault FT encapsulates most of the critical challenges associated with restoring historic armoured vehicles. And those are, in no particular order, location, identification, recovery, strip down, rebuild, then the history of the vehicle itself, and ultimately the ongoing challenge of how do you continue to conserve it and leave it for future generations. We then had the problem of how are we going to find all the parts for it? You're looking for engines, you're looking for gearboxes, you're looking for wheels, you're looking for turrets, you're looking for guns, you're looking for all the stuff that actually goes inside it. The control rods, the seats, the belts, the spanners. It's a never ending process. We didn't even know what we were looking for when we started because we didn't actually have a list of what was in the tank. So at the same time as running around trying to source the obvious parts, you're also trying to find accurate information as to what exactly you're looking for for the rest of it. All the books that have actually been written or had previously been written were all based on each other and there wasn't actually any uh, clear chain of thought that we discovered through this process which actually led us along this path. We had to, in effect, discover this archaeological dig ourselves. We had to lay out what we had outside the shed on the concrete and record everything in minute detail. From there, we could try and work out what was missing. Some of it was blindingly obvious. Clearly, there wasn't an engine or a gearbox or any wheels or a track. So what we had was a hull and some fittings inside the hull, but they weren't clear to us exactly what they were there for. So the whole thing is a gigantic jigsaw puzzle and also a, a journey of discovery using sort of forensic detective skills to try and work out how it all went together. <laughs> This restoration took the better part of 10 years, from actually finding the parts for the vehicle to bringing it to its current state where it's running. And there were some really, really difficult parts to that. Perhaps the biggest challenge was the engine. One of the biggest issues we had was with the lining of the, of the cylinders. The bores in one engine had been very, very badly corroded. And as a result of that, we had to try and find out how to address that and there were two schools of thought one was to just toss the engine and actually go and uh, get another one cast and the other was to try and resurrect the block as it was and so with that in mind what i did was contact a friend of mine who had been with me in the army who was a metallurgist who told us that we should use inhibited hydrochloric acid with which to remove all of the rust from the block and then at the, just thereafter, clean it off and to actually coat the bore in a nickel coating. And that was by actually ha um, hanging a sacrificial anode onto it and then reverse polarizing the power that was going in. And then every morning you would come in, you would actually see how much of the nickel had actually adhered to the side. And thereafter, once that was, uh, was done, we then used copper. And the copper then allowed us that flexibility to be able to seriously hone that down. When we'd compensated for the, uh, the corrosive rings inside the, inside the bore, that was the most complicated thing because, to be honest with you, if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have had an original engine in the FT. 
I suppose the biggest surprise for us working on the tank was the big wheel at the front, which is called the idler wheel, turned out to be made of wood. In this case, when it was originally built, it would have been made of French white oak and consisted of segments bolted together with an iron rim around the outside. We went to a company based down in Ashford who were involved with the Royal Carriage Collection and they were able to reproduce uh, the wheels we needed. They basically had to heat up the hoop, then slot it over the segments, and then chuck large amounts of water all over it in order to shrink the hoop or the band onto the oak segments. The other wheels on it, the, the running wheels themselves, they're hollow and they act as reservoirs for the oil to be slowly released onto the axles and everything else. And the way they achieved that was to stuff them full of horsehair and then put the oil in it, and that acts as a, as a kind of slow release mechanism. So we think that this particular tank that was manufactured around about May 1918, and it's not a tank as we would understand it today, it's, it's not full of um, electrical motors driving turrets and, and loading ammunition. There are two small guys in there. To give you some idea of what it's like, I've got in. Um, it's very, very small and gets very hot. And unlike a modern turret, which probably has some kind of electromechanical system for turning it, this relies on upper body strength. You've got two handles inside the turret, which you then basically use your upper body to turn. It's sitting on ball bearings, very smooth. It's another world in here. It's not like a modern tank where you have four people in it. You've got two crew in here, and I'm sitting in here, and I'm having to load my gun, find a target, turn the turret, and also control the direction in which the driver is going, whilst at the same time being shot at by machine gun bullets, artillery rounds, and God knows what else. On the actual turret, on the plates themselves, that we found imperial measurements. There were absolutely no metric measurements in sight. And so that spurred us on to then go and look at uh, where potentially had this come from, because there's no way that an imperial measurement would have crept into an industrial process in France. Everything there and in Germany at the time was metric. That basically proved to us or indicated to us that these panels for these tanks had actually been produced here in the UK. <laughs> The paint scheme caused us an enormous amount of trouble because everybody's idea when looking at a black and white picture will automatically have a, a picture in their mind's eye as to how they think it should be painted rather than how it was. As we uh, started to disassemble the vehicle, we were noting each and everything that we discovered. One of those was obviously where we could find very good intact paint samples. We took the entire panel that these were on up to Lincoln Conservation. They were the team responsible for the research that was done into HMS Victory and they are the proof house for English heritage. They take basically a slice through the paint samples and each layer they can identify what the colour was and broadly when it was applied. When all the panels came back, when the results from the panels came back and proved to us that there was absolutely no green, for example, on these panels, that was actually a bit of a shock. Everybody assumes that in the First World War the tanks would have been painted green and brown. And then you present them with a, with a tank which basically consists of two colours, uh, light brown and dark brown, with a few black outlines. And there was a lot of blowback on that, a lot of hostility about that. And we had to point out that we'd spent a lot of time and effort in having the paint analysed by specialists and they'd given us a, a very solid scientific basis for these colours. We found no evidence for green. And when you think about it, in the First World War it wouldn't have made a great deal of sense for a lot of the time to have green on the tanks because the landscape was entirely blasted apart by artillery. So if you were to paint your tank green you would be the only mobile bush on the battlefield which would have made you stand out a mile. The conventional wisdom as it was at the time, and still is to a large extent, was very, very much on the wrong track, insofar as the whole industrial process behind the creation of these Renault FTs. So much of this information has been, let's say, put back into the historical community 
not only because of what we published, but because of the questions we've been asking through this process. It was more discovery than anything else. In fact, that has been the most interesting project of all the projects we've run. Discipline and teamwork is absolutely everything. If the individuals within the workshop and the research group are not operating as one, either messages will not be communicated to the people doing the fabrication or doing the restoration directly, or the uh, group that are doing the research uh, are not pushing this to the extent that they should be in order to achieve a perfect end result because the result always has to be perfect. It's a team effort. It involves not just the people here in Kent, it involves people in museums and collections all around the world. It was a long, drawn out, very challenging, tiring process, but it was a phenomenal team of people involved in it. And I suppose it was under Michael with his vision that we were able to achieve all of this. For me, the most exciting thing in doing any of these restorations or in putting any of these vehicles together is the research. And the research to me and the striving for absolute accuracy is everything. When you can achieve that, it gives you so much more satisfaction knowing that what you've put together or what rolls out in front of the public is correct. When it leaves our, our workshops and you see the faces of people seeing it for the first time, that really is everything because that's a, a recognition of the effort that's gone into it and the accuracy within that as well. It's immensely satisfying watching this thing drive around the field. I mean, you spend the better part of 10 years trying to get the thing going and then it starts first time, trundles out of the shed and then spends the rest of the afternoon merrily trundling around a field. It's, it's a great feeling. Personally, I think it's important that people can get a better understanding of history if they can actually experience the sights and the sounds and the smells of the vehicles that were involved. And the First World War is an incredibly important conflict because out of the First World War came the collapse of several continental empires, the rise of the Soviet Union, and ultimately, one could argue, uh, the rise of Nazism and fascism in Italy, followed on by the Second World War and the collapse of the British Empire. So it's, it's critical that we understand what, what led to this, what was going on during that time and what happened afterwards. And anything that we can use to explore those issues needs to be preserved. Uh, I think those vehicles really justify themselves on those grounds alone. Of course, it's exciting from an engineering perspective um, and from a restoration perspective, but they, there has to be more to it than simply just restoring a vehicle for its own sake. And I think that's why we've chosen the vehicles we've chosen, um, because each one gives you an insight into a particular period or a particular theme. And hopefully they'll still be here 100 years from now and people will be benefiting from them.